Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 169, an interview with Dr. Spencer Hartman. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Flute 360 podcast episode. We are so glad that you are here. If you are listening to the audio portion right now, thank you so much, but just know that there is a video element as well. So if you want to see Dr. Spencer Hartman and I in action, you can go over to Heidi K. Begay's YouTube channel or the Flute 360's YouTube channel. I will put the links in the show notes below. And today's conversation is the second episode within this health series for August, 2021. And this is a very special conversation and interview with a dear friend and a colleague. His name is Dr. Spencer Hartman. And many of you may or may not know that we actually went to tech together and worked on our DMAs together. So not only is he an expert in the field of body mapping, but he is a good friend and it makes those conversations that much more exciting and fun. So welcome, Spencer. Thank you so much for being here. And I cannot wait to dive in and pick your brain. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. I'm so excited to be here, too. I have been looking forward to this for quite some time now. Yeah, we've been working and organizing the content, and you've been busy at work putting together valuable resources and content for the listeners, and I cannot wait for them to hear all of the goods. I can't wait either. Yeah. So how have you been? How has your summer been? I have been doing really well. I've been taking some time to rest um, from heavy practice schedule and performing schedule. I've been doing some light teaching here and there. I'm about to go on vacation, um, which I'm looking forward to. And I'm going to go home and visit my parents for a little, all before school starts. So the rest of the summer is pretty packed. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And home is Pennsylvania. Mm, Yeah, Yeah. I'm from uh, central Harrisburg, Hershey, Pennsylvania area. Amish country. (laughs) Good home style cooking. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Growing up, my grandparents were actually from Ohio. And so there's a huge Amish uh, community out there. And so we actually grew up with a lot of Amish dolls and um, Mm -hmm. went on the buggies. And so that brings back memories. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. So there's no beautiful segue from Amish into body mapping. <laughs> How are we going to do that? I don't I know. Don't know. <laughs> let's just go there. So let's, <laughs> so let's start with your background and let's talk about how you pursued or how you got into music and anything that you would like to share with the listeners. So like many of us, I started music pretty young when it was offered to me in school And I went through a couple of different instruments before I started playing the flute. I played the clarinet for a little. I then started the piano, which I still actively practice and perform on. And then I played the marimba and xylophone in the band for many years before I got to high school. And then I finally got uh, to play the flute, which was kind of what I wanted to do the whole time. And so then I was, you know, practicing the flute really hard while I was in high school. I ended up going to college at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh, and I did my undergrad there. I then went to grad school in Newfoundland, Canada, at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And this is where I met one of the sponsoring teachers with the Association for Body Mapping Education, Jennifer Johnson, who was my first kind of real introduction into this material. And then following the completion of that degree, I moved to Lubbock, Texas to study flute at Texas Tech University. And I am currently now, since graduating, working and teaching at Eastern New Mexico University and Texas Tech University, where I am teaching a 16-week body mapping course in the fall, which I am looking forward to uh, seeing how all of this works in a classroom setting. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. That's amazing. 
Yeah. And you just got certified within body mapping, correct? Mm -hmm. So in March, I became a licensed body mapping educator. And this all kind of started, you know, I've, when I was doing all of the initial body mapping work in Canada, I really was interested in it. And I really found interesting new ideas relating to my playing. And then once I left, you know, the information was retained somewhat. And then, you know, when the whole pandemic began, uh, a friend and I, we decided to both, you know, kind of do some additional extra musical training. So we both became licensed body mapping educators together. And then I uh, completed a yoga teacher training and she then became a Eldoa trainer. So it's kind of this holistic wellness movement body piece that we both felt that we were missing in our music making. Yeah, I love that. And I love how you bring um, our attention to the fact that a seed was planted way back, you know, during mm. your undergraduate studies. And then you know, full circle, <laughs> full circle. <laughs> Here you are 10 plus years later saying, hey, actually, I really loved that topic and I want to dive into it more. So you never know how our paths are going to unfold. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I think if I wouldn't have had that excellent foundation into body mapping that I received, at that time from Jennifer Johnson, I don't know if I would have been as interested later in life. So I think that just the quality and the timing of that experience was really important with how I've kind of developed to where I am today. So I'm grateful for that. That's amazing. Very cool. So this whole series is about health and body awareness. And the reason why we are exploring this topic is because 360 listeners have actually requested this information. So just like you, I think there is a need out there and people are starving for more information. And they are curious about their bodies in the practice room and how they can maybe prevent uh, performance related injuries and the like. So before we get into like exercises and demonstrations and the whole enchilada, what is body mapping? So body mapping is the process of refining the neuronal self-representation of our bodies in our brains. In our brains, there's an area of the brain that is plastic and it develops as our um, knowledge of the physiology of the body develops. So this will accommodate growth as we grow and as our bones become longer, our body map is changing to accommodate this growth. This growth I perceive would accommodate for injury, anything that happens to us, any traumas that happen to the muscular skeletal structure will be represented in this body map. And through addressing the issues that we have with our body map, we can essentially help to reduce injury and create efficient and elegant movement in performance and out of performance. Wow. I love that definition. And what I heard from that is or a lot. There was a lot of great gold nuggets in that. But just when you mentioned the fact about like injury, you know, and that will inform our bodies in a different way when we go through an injury. I actually fractured my L5 vertebra. Is that the correct mm -hmm. way to say it? Singular. Mm -hmm. When I was a ballerina. And even though it healed years and years and years later, as I was going through and working with physical uh, therapists and trainers, and we were working on um, developing my back muscles to help my flute playing and things like that, they would notice like I still held my body in a certain way to accommodate this injury that was there and it was very true for my body, but it was no longer there, but my body still was telling myself that it was an issue. So I don't know, that's how I was trying to connect with that information. Well, that's super interesting. So I've never, I don't think I've had a performance related injury. However, just recently I have been experiencing some injury in my sacrum and pelvic area and 
prior to this injury, mapping that area of my body was always difficult for me as I don't feel I had a true grasp over what was actually happening in that area. And then the kinesthesia related to the, the anatomical truth. And so through pain and slight injury in this one area. Now my map is more refined and clearer because I felt sensation that maybe wasn't positive there. Okay. So I think that through my, you know, pain and injury, my map ha has become more refined as well. I see. Yeah, that makes total sense. So speaking of um, performance related injuries, to me, when I read the statistics that are out there, and you can tell me what are the current statistics, but when I read statistics like from the University of Nevada saying that, you know, uh, performance related injuries within the music industry could be as high as 76%, to me, those are pandemic level, you know, staggering statistics. And so I think, you know, in part, a lot of maybe 360 listeners and other musicians out there uh, were craving this information because probably some of us to some degree are going through something right now with our bodies. And so can you address those statistics? And is that a correct figure? I'm just curious. Yeah. So I just did a little bit of research and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics just recently said that 50 to 76 percent of performing musicians working today are working through injury. And I think that that is a staggering number and it is a real problem in the in the field. I think that perhaps the true number is higher than that. I think that there are so many reasons why that could happen. You, there's maybe a stigma associated with injury in the field. Oh, if I'm injured, am I doing it right? Am I good enough, right? And so I think that can absolutely play into why some people might choose to remain silent about their injury mm -hmm. um, and never report. And I think, you know, part of that, I think, stems from maybe this kind of identity crisis that is prevalent among musicians. I find that as I was training and developing as a musician, my identity became, I am a flutist, I am a pianist, I am assuming this role of an instrumentalist, instead of maybe assuming the role of something that I actually am, which is a human being that walks. I'm a human being that opens my door, right? I'm a human being that does these very just everyday things that I also play the flute with my body. And so I think huh. maybe because there's such a high value on people's identity as their art, that could also maybe in fact be playing into why one might not want to report their injury. That is so interesting. You're right. I mean, we lead with, you know, when we meet somebody too, you know, hi, I'm Heidi. And then the next question usually is, what do you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like our value is in our job you know, or the role that we play. And it's like, oh, I'm a flutist. And we forget, you know, my identity is human, Heidi. <laughs> and I just happen to play the flute. So you're right. You bring up an interesting fact, you know, when that identity or that role, maybe being injured in that role, like an injured flutist. So if I identify like I am a flutist, right? And then I get injured, that really hits to the core. And then we don't want to speak up because of it. Absolutely. That's, I think, totally right. Okay. And I think it makes absolute sense why we would want to, like, if I am a flutist, how can I at, reconcile the fact that I'm an injured flutist, an injury maybe caused by my flute playing, I see. caused by my identity? I don't know. I think that there's so many different tangents you can go off of that point to think about and, you know, just reflect on and see, you know, just check in with yourself. And are you being the human you first? I don't know. Yeah. No, yeah, no, I love it. And I've been wondering this, and so I'm just going to say it out loud. You know, when you watch, like growing up in Chicago, the Bulls, 
were the biggest thing in the 90s. Michael Jordan and, you know, Dennis Rodman. You would see a basketball player, for example, fall and say injure his knee or her knee, right? And you, you know, then they get wheeled off the court and then they'll make an announcement on the ABC7 News. Michael Jordan is going to take the season off. And he's going to work with his trainer. (laughs) Mm -hmm. To me, you know, from my perspective, and that might be very small, but from my perspective, there was no like, oh, Michael Jordan got injured and what, you know? And But for musicians and what we do, for some reason, it's a whole different thing. And I just wonder that because there's so much with what we do as musicians you know, in the same way as how we use our bodies like athletes, maybe not in the exact same way, but we work on the mentality aspect of it. We work on our bodies. So it's just very interesting. And I'm very curious as to why in that industry, when a sports athlete gets injured, it's not a big deal. But when a musician gets injured, it's blown up more. Yeah, I think that that's a very interesting point. And when we start to kind of view what we do here with the instrument as something that is athletic, something that requires muscles, maybe something that requires muscular strength in some muscles, right? Something that requires agility, something that requires dexterity and stamina and endurance, right? These are things that are very athletic in nature, and they are things that we absolutely practice in the practice room to have into our own playing. And I think there are very many different similarities between musicians and athletes. And I've heard musicians referred to as small muscle athletes in in the way that we're training and working the same exact way, but the the injury itself isn't so visual, right? I, you know, this might not make, you know, how if Michael Jordan falls and hurts his knee, Obviously, he's not going to go out there on a one-legged scooter shooting hoops. Oh, I see. You know what I mean? Because his knee is injured and he physically can't do it, right? I feel like a lot of our, I feel like a lot of pain that people experience is something that is, that they can push through and isn't visual and no one has to know. And if they don't know it, I don't know it. And it's this kind of thing that they brush under the rug where okay and it's interesting because i i think that athletes use their bodies in a different way than us obviously and i think that athletes like michael jordan people like that the pro ball players today i don't think they expect to play long into their 50s and 60s in past retirement right there's gonna come a point in their lives where someone's gonna say i'm gonna stop playing basketball today Right. And ideally, I think many of the musicians that I know want to experience what the playing is going to be like into their, you know, maturity, true maturity and what that um, process can be. And so I think this comes back to that whole identity thing. You know, we are human beings that play the flute. And I think if we if we really check the human aspect of ourselves, what is my human being doing is that human being doing that thing in the right way in a way that supports that is supported by anatomical reality then those extra tasks playing basketball playing the flute they will kind of work themselves out to also work in a way that supports anatomical reality does that make Mm. Since I kind of rambled there. No, it makes perfect sense. I totally followed it. It was not ramble. It was beautiful (laughs) ramble. (laughs) No, that's amazing. And just this whole idea of identity is, is new to me. And I hadn't thought of that, but it makes a lot of sense. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Absolutely. So besides the practice room, what other elements could be contributing to these pandemic levels of musicians going through injury? I think that a lot of it could absolutely be caused by generational pedagogical trends. So we have a teacher from years, hundreds of years ago, who started playing the violin this certain way and talks about his experience playing the violin. Well, I'm just going to, right? you know, and 
He's been playing the violin the way his teacher taught him to play. And then he teaches his students the way that his teacher taught them to play. And it goes on for generations, this lineage, right? We have them in every instrument, our family trees. Hmm. That first teaching was drawn from an experience that that first teacher had that maybe that student didn't have, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe the students down the line, they don't have the same experiences either, right? So I feel like teaching, whether you're using the clearest, most efficient terms, or you're using imagery, all comes down to how we relate to those ideas. And are they changed by the fact that my experience is not the same as the experience of the teacher. Mm. Yes, very interesting. The reason why I'm over here like, yeah, 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 is because I'm going to do a plug for Dr. Lee Pearson's episode, which aired last week on August 7th. And the reason why I bring that to your attention is because she said the exact same thing, that it was this experience in the moment, and it was great for that person in said generation, and then it gets passed down. And instead of asking ourselves, you know, what is my body experiencing? Am I, what am I noticing? What am I observing? And just being in tune with that rather than this is the way it is. Am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. Or yeah, this is the way generations of people have been doing it. You know, falling into some kind of greater trend that may or may not be supported by your anatomical reality. Okay. So then we as educators, what I'm hearing, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if this is a very (laughs) dramatic statement or something along those lines, but we almost have to maybe reinvent how we teach. Yeah. And I have been thinking about this a lot recently. It's just like, how do we reconcile pedagogy received with pedagogy given, right? How do we decide that this idea that I've received from a teacher is going to work here? And I think we just need to be really honest with whether or not, I, I feel we need to be honest with whether or not what we're saying is fact, right? True fact, or if it's a concept of imagery or something that works for me, right? And then assess whether or not they're the same. And then if they're not the same, then we need to just know that this information that I'm giving you is not fact, but it may help totally, right? And I think it's just coming to terms with, because I mean, it's totally logical for a person to use an image, an image that makes no sense with the human body to, to get a result, right? Mm-hmm. But if the, the student doesn't have the same experience with that image, that idea, the result may not be the same. Sure. No, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Cool. Okay. So there's a lot to this question, and I know it's very meaty, but what are some things that musicians can be doing to prevent these performance-related injuries? Okay, yeah. I think that I think that body mapping, the knowledge that is taught through body mapping, needs to become universal common knowledge in the field, right? I think maybe that could be a a real good step one for people. Know the information. Know how your body is functioning when it is working around an instrument that is not of us. Okay. So how is my body? This arm is crossing my body. How? What is moving? Where is it moving? Why did it move to get there? Right? And then... So integrate the knowledge. And then I think something we can do as humans that I think sedentary life doesn't allow us to do sometimes is go through the full range of motion in every joint, right? Every day. And so that way we're always just like moving that joint in its full range of motion, allowing it to 
not be limited, allowing it to be free. So, you know, taking the wrists in their circles, Mm -hmm. flex, extend, flex, extend. We can do lateral flexion. We're just moving around the joint. So in our joints, we'll get into some mapping now. There are um, what's called bursa sacs, and there's many of them throughout the body, but they are fluid-filled sacs that lubricate the joints. So you'll see, like, in a... This is an elbow. This would be our bursa sac, and there's... um, Well, this would be encapsulated in tendons, and there would be bursa in here that are um, full of fluid. And as we go throughout the day, the fluid wears away, and then as we sleep, the fluid regenerates. So we want to just make sure that we're lubricating these joints through movement every day to make sure that we're not allowing any part of our movement to be compromised. Ooh. So I think those are kind of two things. I think integrate the, the knowledge okay, and then take the body through its full range of motion. And that can be done with a ton of different activities, swimming, running. You might be able to cover quite a bit of the range of motion, right? You can do these in other ways okay. besides playing the flute. Yeah. No, I love that. And then just being aware, obviously having that knowledge is so important, but then I think knowledge is power, right? So like when we do get injured and we think, oh, bad flutist, or whatever, <laughs> bad, right? <laughs> um, maybe just being aware of like what you just said, you know, the fluid, you know, here I'm thinking of like a secretary at the desk who's typing all the time or her or his hand is always, you know, fixed on the mouse. Well, and then you do that eight, nine, 10 hours a day, 40, 50 hours a week, and you're locked and you're like, oh, but why is my body betraying me? Why am I injured? Well, <laughs> maybe just being aware like, oh, you know, I, I wasn't fluid. I, my body is not designed to be locked for 40, 50 hours a week. Then maybe that takes away the bad Heidi for getting injured. I mean, well, that's like, I think that's absolutely does make sense, but it brings up another topic maybe for another day about just our self talk in general. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, A whole different can of worms. Okay. I need to address a couple other things there. Why am I treating myself this way? I'm a human being that did nothing wrong and I don't need to apologize. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just thinking, oh, I don't know. I just envisioned the secretary with her hands locked at the keyboard and then wondering, oh, why is this happening to me? Why am I getting carpal tunnel? Well, if you knew or if we knew more about the wrists or the arms or how our body functions, then maybe, you know, not being so surprised when those flare ups happen or the pain happens because we're Mm -hmm. not using our body the way it's designed to be used. Yeah, let's go there. Can we actually explore this idea of typing and carpal tunnel? Because it's so real and it's caused by something. You know what I mean? So we have a carpal tunnel. Did you know that? Like it's an actual kind of place in our bodies. Um, And you can see it here. And if you look, there's this divot here. Okay. This is the actual carpal tunnel. And so we have nerves that go through that carpal tunnel that gives sensation to our hands. Okay. Okay. Among typers, I think commonly carpal tunnel is caused by arresting a compressing of this area Mm. on the desk or the computer. And then by resting that there and compressing that over and over again for 50 hours a week for 20 years years of work, right? We've now compressed the nerves in here habitually daily. Mm. So there are some things I've adjusted with myself at the computer to kind of help with this idea. So one of the things that in body mapping we like to avoid over long extended periods of time is this idea of ulnar deviation. So this is, it looks like this when we have a lateral flexion to the outside on both hands. And this happens in a lot of reasons, right? When we shake our hands, we live in a thumb-oriented world. When we open the door, it's thumb-oriented and we're deviated quite a bit 
all the time. And so something you can do to help get yourself out of deviation is think of a line between your pinky finger and your ulna, the outside bone, or your ring finger and the outside bone. I tend to go for ring finger for me because if I think pinky finger, I am too radially deviated now to do more. So it's not super neutral for me. So I'm like a middle ring finger kind of guy. But what I'll do, yeah. Yeah, I'm more ring finger too, I think. So what I'll do when I approach the keyboard is I'll approach it with my pinky or my ring fingers first, pulling the ulnas with it, and I'll place them. And then I'll actually approach the key more, the keyboard more, um, you can't see it like that, just more um, like this instead of like this, thumbs first. So if you put thumbs on the pinky, thumbs on the space bar, and then place your home row keys, you're deviated. Oh, yeah. 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 If you place the pinkies on the A and the semicolon, and then place every other one in order, and then place the thumbs, are you deviated anymore? No. Hmm. Yeah. So I've kind of, I keep a little bit of loft in my hands while I'm typing, and I usually place the pinkies first. And it kind of changes the direction, the angles of which the fingers go. But I find completely more comfort in this Mm. kind of approach to the keyboard. Yeah. And that that also plays a serious role on the flute, too, right? Right. Yeah. So let's, like, bring it back. If we have our flutes here and we set our pinkies first, Mm -hmm. we're already going to be in a place that is different than this and you can play around with shaking it out how does this feel i'm going to place my fingers first then my thumb okay i noticed that shake it out now i'm going to place my pinky roll the fingers down and set my thumb is there a difference in the quality of that poise Mm -hmm. right you can do it with both hands and assess you know whether or not there is some extra work happening to deviate you okay if that makes sense yeah no makes perfect sense and I'm glad I kind of thought about, you know, this idea of, you know, a secretary at a keyboard because, I mean, everybody who's listening to this right now is either a student or a professor, or even if you're a performer, you know, full time, you're at the computer. I mean, how many thousands and hundreds of emails do we get day in and day out? It's mm-hmm. insane, you know, and again, like away from the flute, what other activities, you know, are we rolling inward towards the keyboard? right? You know, and then how are we using our bodies during these different activities like typing and, you know, whatever. And then when we come to our instrument, maybe what elements are we bringing into the practice room that don't serve us well? Mm. Yeah. And I think it, you know, it kind of goes back to that idea of identity. If we are a human playing the flute, our body is going to move in a human way, right? Okay. If we're a flutist playing the flute, we are, there's something there, right? We're type A people. We want something, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we will make it happen. And we do things that aren't necessarily the most organically human okay. to do it. The flute itself is asymmetrical. And then we like to sit here and practice like this for three hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think if we are a human being that has a, a spine, that has legs that deliver weight and we have bodies, we have arms that hinge from here and are nice and, you know, expanded and allow for this movement and we allow the nerves to not be compacted and we allow for a lightness that is just a human lightness and we play the flute that way, I'm convinced that a lot of it will just bleed over. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I love it. So in all of your uh, studies and research in this area, what is the number one aspect of the body that you wish more people knew about? Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about support. Okay. Um, So oftentimes, and I know throughout my training, I've been told numerous times that in order for me to have a supported sound with air that is supported and all of this, you know, support that I need to engage 
muscularly with my abdomen. So we talk about our cores and our abdominal washboard abs. But let's just play around here. I want you to, you know, while you're sitting, just really flex your abs and take a deep breath and notice what that feels like. Really flex your abs and release. And then see if you can really flex your back and inhale and notice that. And now just let it be natural and take a breath. Was there a difference in the quality of the breath between those three examples? I, yes, I felt more constricted with the flexing in steps one and two. Absolutely, right? And so then here I am flexing actively to play, to expel air. And then when I inhale, I'm breathing through flexed abs, right? And so now like the whole idea of support has just now kind of amped up and kind of spiraled out of control. You know what I mean? Okay. So when in body mapping, we talk about support related to our central skeletal support. So we refer to our spines. So let's just take a moment and do some mapping. So when we're mapping, we are going to be conscious of size, shape, and function of whatever region, joint, area involved. So let's consider our spines, the size. I want you to just, while we're doing this, I'll kind of coach you through it. Consider the shape, the size of it. Think about vertical size. Think about horizontal size and then think about like 3D width size and just kind of take stock of what you think you know. And then we want to consider the shape. So is it a circle? Is it a line? Is it um, straight? Is it curved? Is it square? Right? So just kind of take stock with what you know. And then function. What does the spine do? What are the functions of the spine? And then once you've kind of assessed what you think you know about the spine, then we need to go in and do the mapping. So here we go. Size. Our spine extends from our AO joint, which is our top joint here, where the occiput connects with the atlas. Okay. So this is our AO Atlanto occipital joint. And we can find its location roughly right behind our um, ear lobes. So if we think, okay, the AO joint is directly between my fingers. That is where the head connects to the skull. So that is the most, the most vertical boundary of the spine. And then we need to consider its length down to the bottom. So our tailbone. Mm -hmm. So we are now becoming aware of inside of ourselves a, a skeletal structure that extends from our AO joint down to the very tip of our tailbone. So that mm -hmm. is the length. It's width in the throat and neck region, the spine takes up about half of the width of the neck and throat. Wow. It takes up about a third of the width front to back of the torso okay. and about half of the width front to back of the lumbar region of the spine. So the spine itself takes up a large amount of space in our body. Yeah. So we're going still for size. Okay. Now, when we go to shape, we see a spine that uh, has curves to it. There are four curves. We have a cervical curve, a lumbar curve, and a, I mean, a thoracic curve and a lumbar curve. Okay. And we have a sacral curve down here at the bottom. So you can okay. see that it goes like this and curves all the way up to the top. What this curving does is it allows for weight to be delivered down. So size, shape, and function. So we're going to go to function now. The cool. front of the spine is smooth. We can see that. I can rub my hands on it. Very smooth. 
And this is because all of our internal organs are really closely adjacent to the spine. So if we had this bumpy side <laughs> on the inside, it would like be tearing away at all of our organs all the time. That's fine. So, yeah. <laughs> and so we can see that all of the vertebrae here are separated by a disc. And this disc will compress and decompress at in movement to allow for that weight delivery and that protection. The back is bony protrusions, and this is where tendons can attach to muscles, and it is meant to protect the spinal cord. So you can see anything in yellow coming out of here is nerves that come through the spinal cord, and it starts at the top and works its way all the way down. So the bony part is meant to purely just protect that spinal cord that gives us our movement. Mm. And then, so that's function number one. The processes, their function, um, also while being protective, is also to resist motion into dangerous places, right? So the eventually the processes will stop me from going too far, mm. right? I can't twist the spine anymore because now all of the processes are kind of cutting off that range of motion. Okay. So the, you know, we can't bend this farther than the bones will allow. Um, so that's kind of the function of the processes here. Mm. So now that we've kind of mapped our spine a little bit, I want you to consider this while we do an exercise, okay? okay. So first what I want you to do is while you're sitting, just lift your arms into the air and really just do it a couple times and notice the quality of movement. How much muscular work do you have to use? Are you working to get those arms up? And now, once you've done that a couple times, I want you to really focus your awareness on the spine, the stacking of the vertebrae that are separated by discs this central stacking part being deeper in your body than the bony part. So our, our true skeletal core, like the core of an apple, is going to be this spine. And I want you to think about that spine again while we lift our arms. And notice if there's a difference in the quality of movement when you did, thought about the support of the spine. Interesting. What did you notice? I don't. I noticed that I was taller the second time. Mm -hmm. I just. Like I don't know. So. Yeah, I just felt taller when you brought my attention to that part of the, uh, the skill, the skeleton. Yeah. So maybe perhaps something in your map that was, maybe less refined that is more refined now maybe is that full vertical length. Okay. You know, that could absolutely be benefited by what we just did, the mapping we just did, right? Mm. And now you're feeling that bring to the spine the knowledge you know, I did this, I felt taller. Mm. I know when I think of this skeletal support, I feel like a, like something's helping me. <laughs> like, I don't okay. know, like there's something raised in my arms up and I'm feeling a lightness that I didn't feel before. And I think it's coming from well, I think it's coming from a lot of different things. Gravity, normal force up, right? Okay. All of these kind of ideas, they play together to make the movement happen in a way. But I find generally more ease in my movement and flute playing when I think about all of the facets of the spine. Yes. The second word I was going to use too was it was more easy. Mm hmm I didn't know Great. how to really articulate it, but when you said it feels like something's helping me, mm -hmm. that resonated with me. I'm like, oh, yeah, with ease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. right. So that, you know, kind of idea of support where I have changed my definition of support from muscular engagement to skeletal support has been a key um, area in my map that has been refined. Um, that I think about every day. And I want to okay. just do one more. I have one more like big takeaway. Okay. That habitual tensing of the whole body usually begins with a habitual tensing of the neck, the muscles of the neck. And to get out of this habitual tensing of the whole, 
we often first will have to address the tensing in the neck. So oh, interesting. Uh huh. So is think that? about it. Well, think about it. We have our arm, and I'm really working it. I'm like squeezing and I'm flexing, and the work isn't radiating much past my arm region, right? Uh -huh. But then think if you like, <laughs> I look crazy now, but like really engage your neck, it yeah. like radiates throughout your whole body. Oh, okay. And that's because there, there's something that people call the deep front line. And it's this set of these super adjacent muscles that are so deep in our bodies that essentially connect all the way from feet up through the legs in the middle of the body up. And because of their close proximity, they're almost related in some way, all the way up to the tongue. So we have this kind of full body connection that's happening. And I think it starts here in the neck. Okay. So some things I like to consider about my neck in terms of mapping muscles or the, so instead of, in terms of mapping is that A, half of the width is spine, right? So mm -hmm. let's just like start addressing, okay, I'm, I have a nice healthy amount of spine in there. And then the neck muscle, it's entirely vertical. There's some diagonal quality to some of them, but generally they go up and down. There's not one that goes like around the neck like this. Okay. When a muscle works, the muscle will shorten. So say I have my bicep. It's attached at one point on the, the lower arm, and then it crosses up higher. And so because when this muscle gets short, it pulls pulls on this bone to move the, the joint. So this muscle, my bicep has now shortened Got when it. I flex it. Okay. So okay. we want to, when we're finding release, we want to think length, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have nice vertical muscles, length in the, in the, in the muscle, just allow these to be long and free. And then notice while we think about that, freedom in the neck, do we feel a, a quality in the freedom of the body change, mm. you know, and just kind of take stock and can we release the neck more? Something I like to do is I like to just warm my hands up sometimes, really warm them up. Okay. And because I'm bald, it's really easy on me, but I put my warm hands on my head and neck here. Okay. And I trace the warmth. I trace the shape of my fingers. I really bring my awareness to it. And I might even let the hands like hold me a little bit, right? Like I give my head and neck, oh, that looked different when you did that, Heidi. Mm -hmm. um, give your head a little bit to it and then release the hands and still give your head to them a little bit. What did you feel? It feels freeing. Yeah, I feel like when I'm like, there is something helping me. Yeah. Pull my head up. <laughs> That's not my muscles. Yeah, it, it feels it good. It felt think... like I was being cradled. Even after I took my hands away, it felt like this warm cradle. Yeah, and I am finding literally a hundred times a day. I'm like, ooh. Cradle and me. I, yeah. Hold me. Yeah. Yeah, hold me. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reason why I say that, because it's very interesting in some of this, I'm not by any means, and I someday want to be, but the one semester that I studied the Alexander Technique, a lot mm -hmm. of it always went back to like fetal, the fetal position, and what do we yeah. do as a baby, or as a toddler, you know, and just observing those natural movements and how as we grow up, some of those um, rhythms or movements or something is, you know, changed because of years and experience mm -hmm. and, you know. Um, so anyways, when I say cradle, it brings me back to that. And I was just trying to make a connection between the two. I think it's an excellent connection. All right. I mean, when we want to know how to do something the right way, we need to watch a baby do it. Yeah. Right. Watch yeah. a baby get up. Right. And then notice how that is different than how you get up, right? <laughs> and then train and coordinate the movement and assess whether or not the way your body is moving is contradicting or supporting that movement. And I think that when we 
allow for the movement to always be a human experience over a flutist experience, oftentimes the flutist will receive the benefits of that human work. Mm. Yes, because we've been a human longer than we've Absolutely. been a flutist. And maybe the identity is more foundational, you know, more instinctual than maybe the identity that we have as a flutist. Yes. I love that. And thank you for bringing, bringing it back to like the beginning of our conversation. It's all mm -hmm. connected, you know, and bringing in these different themes and ideas and shedding light on it here and there. I don't know. It just helps with my comprehension. Wonderful. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, somebody who is listening to this episode or listening to this series, they may or may not be experiencing some pain within their body. And like, you know, we were saying earlier, sometimes during a painful season like this, it can feel very lonely, right? Um, perhaps among many other things. So if somebody is listening to this and they think, oh my gosh, like I need help. What do I do? What resources would you like you know, to give them or what advice would you like to share with them today? Mm -hmm. I think that one of the most important things is if your body is in pain, first and foremost, you should see a doctor, a medical doctor. You know, I know at the Association for Body Mapping Education, we are movement educators, right? We are trying to teach the quality um, and efficiency in our movement that will help us while playing the flute. Whereas some of us have doctorates in music. We are not that kind of doctor that knows that detailed wealth of knowledge. So first things first, if you're in pain and it is causing your life uh, grief, I recommend that you see a physician first. Then I think once you have handled that, or if that's not necessary for your condition, then I would say that knowledge is the first thing that you can do. Really understand the structure of the arm, the structure of the leg, the structure of the spine, and really perceive that as the anatomical knowledge as being true in, in your experience. Mm -hmm. So I know uh, our, the Association for Body Mapping Edu Education, uh, we all teach a course that is six hours, um, and it is called What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body. And in this, we talk about awareness and kinesthesia. We talk about six places of balance. We talk about the arms. We fully map our structures of breathing, and then we map the legs in movement. And so after a six-hour course, you have a very strong foundational reference point for any body work that you do after. And I know that I have plans to present two courses, full courses a year. And so one is likely going to be coming up in the fall, upcoming fall semester. So I, that is something that I would encourage you to all look into. And then I would also encourage you to find books regarding body mapping and instrument specific problems. So the, at, with the Association for Body Mapping Education, there are wonderful teachers across all instruments and genres. And a lot of them, a lot of instruments have their own specific version of the, of a book that relates all of the information from the six hour course into a hefty tome. Neat. So, I would see a doctor okay. and then I would educate yourself. And then I would work on moving my body through its full range of motion in some way that is not the instrument. Okay. Excellent advice. And so for the classes that you are offering fall of 2021, are these remote classes? And if so, where can people access the link to the class? So these will likely be all done remotely as we found that it's not a bad format for teaching body mapping um, lessons and classes due to the images and the exercises. Um, so they will all be done remotely and um, registration information for that will likely be found on my website, uh, Spencer Hartman Music, 
www.jeffreyhoff.com. And there you can contact me using any of the links down below in the bottom of the page. And I am more than happy to help you help introduce you further to body mapping or yoga, even if you want to explore that full range of motion in a, you know, easy, gentle, controlled way. Nice. Wonderful. So I know we've covered a lot (laughs) and I really picked your brain hard, but I don't want to cut off the conversation and you go, oh, wait, but one more thing. Are there any last sentiments that you would like to leave this discussion with? You know, I want to really just drive home the fact that we are humans first. And, you know, we, while that, you know, doesn't, it might not satisfy us the way that a Mm -hmm. extravagant performing career on stage in the spotlight might satisfy our, you know, career goals. Um, It's absolutely an identity and a relationship that we need to foster. And so I think, you know, we we need to address the self-talk, the way that we do talk to ourselves, because I think it is absolutely pivotal and powerful in our growth and in the way we think. I think we need to approach things in a way that we are allowed to be curious and allowed to have this childlike curiosity to how we approach whatever it is we're doing. And then we need to move as human beings in a human way. So that way, when we play the flute, it's a human playing the flute Mm -hmm. instead of a flutist with no depth. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I'm really great here, you know, and I'm great here and my sound is beautiful, but have I made a true connection to my experience and that comes I mean and so many things can shape that you know every experience we have compounds into this you know pool of experience that is our existence I feel Mm. and so I think when we're just taking care of the the body that is experiencing the world that we're in I think the flute making is going to be more powerful more exciting and hopefully less painful. Yes, (laughs) that's the goal Mm -hmm. (laughs) or one of the goals. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, and so much of that resonates with me. It's not the same, but going back to this like human experience and what we do here and how it can be amplified through our instruments can be profound work, you know, and just my reality of podcasting for three years and being in my voice and being okay with my quirkiness and dorkiness and still, you know, um, articulating what I want to convey, you know, through my very unique voice and bringing that, that experience of coming back to Heidi and sharing ideas with the world and talking and having these great conversations with friends and colleagues like you um, and being able to articulate these ideas in my body, you know, through my uniqueness. And then when I pick up the flute, those two experiences, I don't know, it's just, it's amplified. And so I know it's different, but it's kind of the same. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. And just letting that voice come through the flute naturally, because I don't know, I'm working on me over here. So I'm rambling, but... I know. I think it's total. I mean, I say this a lot. I feel like, you know, there when we have our flute here, there's like half an inch between our aperture and the blowing edge of that instrument. And all I want to do is get all up in there and get in my own way. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> Instead of like my human body is going to move air and the flute is going to take it because the flute is not me. Right. Mm. The, the, the tube itself is going to respond to, I mean, unless there's mechanical issues, right? The tube is going to respond the same way all the time. I just need to make sure that I'm not compromising the human experience of blowing into it. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So we do a fun segment at the end of the show called Picks, and it can be anything under the sun. It could be your favorite cereal or favorite TV show. What is your pick for today? 
So my pick for today, in my free time, I like to read fantasy novels. And I have formed quite the collection over the past year and a half. But the, my pick is uh, the first book in a epic fantasy series called The Stormlight Archive. And this first book is called The Way of Kings. It's a thick book, but it, the prose are so easy and digestible and the characters are telling stories that you just want to keep spending time with. So it is gripping and there are four books out and it is a wonderful way to kind of disconnect from, you know, the things that we have to do. Yeah. (laughs) No, I love it. And I love seeing you add on these uh, books into your book list through the website Goodreads. Because we're mm-hmm. friends there, and I get to see you adding titles into your list or saying, I read this book. And so it's kind of cool to to see that list grow through yeah, Goodreads. I love that too. I look at your list all the time, and I'm like, that is that is great nonfiction. And I'm just like, oh, I don't, <laughs> I'd rather have my stories. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, I have. Uh, not picked out a pick today, but usually I go right off, you know, the fly and decide what my pick will be in the moment. It's kind of cool. You know, I get to kind of improv here, but seeing you in Lisa Garner Santa's office, it brings me back to Texas tech days and just reminiscing on fond memories with friends. That's my pick for today is Uh leaving, you know, her office there from lessons and saying, let's quick go down to Starbucks and get a tea or coffee before rehearsal or before this next class. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of fun to reminisce. And just especially since you're sitting in that office, it's like, oh, it it brings me back. So that's my pick for today. Yeah, this room is a very important room in my life. So (laughs) I love being here. (laughs) Yeah, no, very uh, special memories there. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Spencer Hartman, for your time, talents, and expertise. And we so appreciate the knowledge that you have purged into our earbuds. And we thank you so much. I thank you so much for having me. I am I had just enjoyed it so much. And as I said before, if anyone needs to get a hold of me, my contact information can be found on my website, spencerhartmanmusic.com. Or I can be emailed at spencerhartmanmusic at gmail.com. Awesome. Have a great day, and we will talk soon. The School of Music at Texas Tech University prepares professional musicians, educators, and industry leaders to take control of their futures. The people, the program, and the power of a top-tier university differentiate our TTU School of Music students. We ensure that TTU faculty, students, and alumni have three keys. They engage successfully as scholars and performers. They continue to expand their career for years to come with bold strategy and experience. And they serve impeccably as leaders who understand the process, the peak performance skills, and people value that makes TTU's School of Music and Lubbock, Texas a destination of choice. People are at the heart of our institution. This commitment ensures that each student experiences major ensembles, band, choir, jazz, orchestra, and opera, chamber music, stellar academics, as well as individual attention in private lessons. The vernacular music program with tango orchestra, mariachi band, Baltic and Celtic ensembles, Medieval Band, and Research Forums differentiates the TTU program by being an offer for both undergraduate and graduate students. Performance facilities include the 541-seat Hemley Recital Hall, which houses an 84-rank Holt Camp organ consisting of 4,469 pipes. Home to the largest instrument collection in West Texas, the School of Music provides Fazioli and Steinway concert grand pianos, a Kingston French double harpsichord, a Martin harpsichord, and we are fortunate to have a 36-bell carillon. 
The School of Music is an accredited member of the National Association of Schools of Music and offers bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in music and music education. Let's talk about flute. 